Hello, fiendlings, and happy Halloween. Welcome to the podcast production of the second novel in the Black series, The Black Arrival. If you haven't listened to The Black, the first book in the series, don't worry. This is more or less a standalone novel, although it definitely won't hurt to read the first one. When I pitched the idea of The Black to Severed Press, I had no intention of there being a sequel, let alone five more books. By the time I was three quarters through writing The Black, I knew there would be two more novels if I wanted to write them. Obviously, I did. The Black series currently consists of three published novels, two unpublished novels, and one that's about 80% finished. In short, there's four more books in this series after this one. Starting in 2024, we'll publish the last three books in the series to finish the M2 cycle. Now that we're on the right schedule, you should receive an uninterrupted podcast presentation of the rest of the Black series. Every week, from now until it's finished, you're going to get an 18 to 30 minute fix of a story. Considering each story will have between 22 and 36 episodes, you might have figured out it's going to take a while to get through them all. Which is why, if you can't wait, go check out the Fireside Audio audiobooks as well as the ebooks, trade paperbacks over at Amazon.com. And if you want signed editions of any of the books, go to my store at payhip.com slash Paul E. Cooley or check out my site. One last thing. Thank you to Fireside Audio for allowing me to bring Joe Hempel's awesome narration to the podcast, and thank you to Joe for doing such a fantastic job with my words. Until next time, be safe, have a fantastic Halloween, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode one of The Black Arrival. Prologue The slate-colored ocean rippled. The sun glared down behind blankets of clouds. Vivian yawned into her mic and checked the instruments. In the service, she'd hovered just above the desert floor before dropping troops into remote fire bases. Now, it was water. She enjoyed racing to the rigs. Flying execs to their meetings was boring. At least the ocean was a challenge. Rig hopping was a blast. She wished the weather system threatening leaguer was already in her way. That would make the trip more interesting. But as it was, the waves were large the froth white as snow, and the winds were choppy. Smile on her face, Vivian checked her fuel gauge and then pushed the throttle another notch. I know we're supposed to get this done quickly, her co-pilot said through the radio, but you're really pushing it. She grinned. Hines, why don't you worry about picking up that barrel and making sure you don't drop the damn thing? The co-pilot sighed. He was already in the cargo area and sitting by the door. Yes, ma'am. Vivian checked their position. ETA, two minutes, Hines. Yes, ma'am. A black dot appeared on the horizon. It slowly grew in size, and after a moment, she made out the blinking red lights at the top of the oil derrick. There it was. Leaguer. It wasn't the largest rig she'd ever flown to. In fact, PPE had a few other rigs in the area that dwarfed it. But Leaguer was an offshore platform which meant in heavy weather, landing on it was like dropping atop a seesaw. She bit her lip. The waves were a little restless, but hardly dangerous. She made out the landing beacon sticking out to the side of the platform. Four men waited for her on the deck, an orange barrel between them. Vivian clucked her tongue. Hines, you ready? Yes, ma'am. He sounded tired and annoyed. Hines hated riding in the cargo area. She didn't blame him. He should have been in the pilot cabin and watching the ocean slide by. Occasionally, she even let him drive, but they had three other rigs to hit on the way back, and at least one refueling stop. PPE had expedited Leaker's sample, but that didn't mean it was the only one heading to Houston. It was going to be a long day. After collecting the barrels and refueling at sea, Vivian and Hines would fly to the mainland. A cargo plane was already waiting for them. Vivian hoped there wouldn't be any problems with the two other rigs. As she'd said to Leaguer's rig chief, they had a tight timeline and getting the oil to the cargo plane was only part of it. She slowed the chopper above the landing circle and descended. When the helicopter touched the metal platform, the aircraft hardly twitched. Nice landing, Hines said. A warning light blinked when Hines had opened the door. She heard his voice through the headset as he told the roughnecks where to place the barrel. She stretched her back and tapped her foot. Come on, Hines. Hold your water, he said. No, not you. She clicked off her mic and chuckled. Poor Hines. Paperwork, barrels, no flying. She'd tell him to take a nap when this was done. The warning light flashed green, 
and then held steady. Clear, Hines said. Let's get back in the air. Vivian clicked her mic back on. Roger. She pulled on the stick, and the helo rose smoothly from the platform. She turned back toward the ocean and hit the throttle. As the chopper raced above the waves, she imagined Leaguer getting smaller and smaller in the distance. Vivian? Hines said over the radio. Yeah? We hitting turbulence or something? Damn barrel is vibrating. She cocked an eyebrow. Um, no, Hines. Fucking bizarre. You need a nap, and now. We have another 40 minutes before we touch down again. Close your eyes, I got this. Good, Hines said. I'm still a little hungover. Yeah, she said, I noticed. Maybe put your back against that barrel and get a massage. He laughed. Maybe I'll try just that. Vivian didn't bother to respond. He could sleep, she would fly. The ocean spread to infinity in all directions. It was the kind of view she loved. Another four hours of flying today, and then she could rest. Maybe she'd even let Hines do some of the work for once. Book One, The Barrel Chapter One The tinted windows did little to keep out the sunlight. That's why the blinds were down and the office lights were off. Simpson sat behind his desk. The widescreen monitor cast blue-white light across his face. The report on the screen was... Interesting. PPE's exploration rig, Leaguer, had finally brought up oil from the M2 trench. After more than two years of preparation, the company finally had a stake, and it looked like a gold mine. A single eight-gallon test barrel of oil was in the air. The helicopter had picked it up from Leaguer and then rig-hopped to Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. The delivery company loaded it on a private plane and flew the barrel to Tokyo, and those were just the first steps in getting it to Houston. Simpson stared at the map on his screen. The barrel still had several hours before it reached Tokyo. After customs and etc., the barrel wouldn't make it to Houston for another full day. And that's if there were no delays. Delays. Simpson sighed and closed the travel map window. He brought up the email client, selected two emails, and brought them up side by side. It wasn't enough to be the first company to drill M2. It wasn't enough to be the first company using new technology to explore the trench. And it wasn't enough that PPE was the first major offshore company to throw away the idea of contractors and subcontractors and use only corporate-owned and salaried assets. No, that wasn't enough. On top of that, he had a major personality issue going on. Leaguer's rig chief, Martin Vrabel, and the head of engineering, Thomas Calhoun, were not getting along. In fact, the two men seemed to hate each other, and on a rig that far out in the ocean, it was a little disconcerting. Both men were consummate professionals, yet they didn't seem to agree on anything. In the past week, he'd seen nothing but gripes from Vrabel about Calhoun's team and their sense of entitlement. From Calhoun, nothing but disdain for Vrabel's pomposity and micromanagement. Calhoun was an industry legend. That's why Simpson had hired his crew in the first place. Vrabel had to get along with them. He just had to. Some friction was expected, but Simpson had thought for sure that they were a good match. Now he wondered. This latest incident wasn't as much about personality conflicts as questions about expertise. And that was going too far. Calhoun's team had performed the first cut analysis of the M2 oil. Calhoun's geologist, Shauna Sigler, had written up the report. If the shareholders saw the redacted report, PPE's share price would skyrocket. If, however, they saw the raw report, he didn't think the share price would do anything but plummet. According to Sigler's analysis, the oil in M2 was pristine, perhaps the cleanest, lightest weight crude ever discovered. Refining it would cost next to nothing. Regardless of how far the price of oil dropped, M2 would provide PPE an incredible amount of revenue for decades to come. But there was a catch. There always is, Simpson thought. Sigler had also included some startling, if not downright hinky, conclusions. She'd found a strange substance in the core sample that may be biological. She also suggested the oil might in fact be contaminated. While Sigler hadn't postulated what it could be contaminated with, she had put a warning in the report. And that's when the shit hit the fan.
Vrabel had sent Simpson an email along with the report. His assessment? Sigler and Calhoun were crazy. They were stalling for some reason and doing their best to inhibit the drilling. He wanted them off the rig. That, of course, was out of the question. Without Calhoun and his team, Leaguer didn't stand a chance of mapping M2, much less finding the sweet spots. So that was a non-starter. To make matters worse, Calhoun had sent an email telling Simpson that he'd happily leave the rig if that's what PPE wanted. The very idea sent a chill down Simpson's spine. The oil industry was pretty incestuous. If someone screwed up, everyone knew about it. If there was friction, everyone knew about it. And that meant the shareholders would discover it too. Oh, you could hide things from them, sure, but ultimately the secrets got out into the world. There was no way to keep that from happening. He swept his eyes from one email to the other. Acid burned in his stomach. They were less than a day away from drilling the next well. He had to make a decision. God, he wanted a cigarette and a shot of beam. But at ten in the morning, it was a bit early for either. He composed a different email to each man, but the content was essentially the same. Behave, work together, get the job done. While he could be blunt with Vrabel, dealing with Calhoun was a bit trickier. The legendary engineer would bite if prodded the wrong way, and Simpson knew it. After he finished composing the two emails, he read each aloud, ensuring they both said the same thing. When he was certain he was happy with the words, he clicked send on each email. Simpson leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands behind his head. Ziegler's raw report stared at him from the left side of the screen. The right side was the redacted version they'd forwarded to the testing facility. He looked at the clock, saw it was nearly 10.30, and sighed. He'd call Mike Beaudry over at Hal and make sure the testing department had the report. Maybe he'd even invite Beaudry out for lunch. Anything to make sure Hal did their best, fastest work on the incoming barrel. The shareholders had to know PPE was sitting on a gold mine, and Hal would prove it. Simpson grinned. Rise in stock price? Bonuses? Everyone riding the tide and making money? That's what they needed. Now he just needed Hal to put the final pieces together. By next week, Simpson, PPE Vice President of Drilling Operations, would be richer than he ever imagined possible. The phone rang. Mike Beaudry stared at it until the caller ID lit up. He rolled his eyes, reached out, and picked up the black receiver. This is Mike he said. It's Simpson. Of course it is, Mike grinned. And I'll bet you're calling to check up on us. The receiver filled with laughter. Simpson was a drinker and a smoker, and his grovelly voice was a stark contrast to his high-pitched belly laugh. Mike couldn't help but smile. Well, yes, Simpson said. We wanted to make sure y'all got the report and are ready. We did. And yeah, Cheevers has taken lead on it as requested. They're going to work the sample all weekend, as long as it takes. I'm sure they'll do a fine job, Simpson said. I talked to the CEO, and he's greenlit a bonus on top of what we're paying if it's done by Sunday morning. Mike blinked. A bonus? Call it goodwill money, Mike. I know you take care of your people, and I know they're damn good at what they do. We just wanted to provide a little more incentive. Okay, Mike said. I'm not going to ask about numbers, but thank you for the offer. You're welcome. You'll be there all weekend, too? Mike sighed. As always, if my people are working overtime, I'm working overtime. That's the deal. Not sure how you do that. Mike laughed. We're trying to grow the company. It takes what it takes. Call it my lack of life. To that end, you available for lunch today? We could snort a shot or two. He shook his head. No can do. Too much work. We're still trying to get the new building online, and I have to spend the day yelling at the construction company, not to mention getting my office ready to move. Okay, rain check? Definitely. The barrel should arrive early afternoon. By then, Leaguer should be preparing to drill the second well. So the faster we get, I get it. If we have the results fast, then you can bring up more samples and get more analysis and start setting revenue projections. You know me all too well, Simpson said. I'm glad you understand. I do. I'll be in touch if we have any questions. All right, Mike. Good talking to you. And you. Bye. Adios. The phone went dead. 
Mike replaced the receiver and stared up at the ceiling. Bonus? No one ever pays a damn bonus on top of a hot shot. That's crazy. But money was money. He'd do his best to make sure they made the timeline. Mike tapped his fingers on the desk and then hit a button. The speakerphone sprang to life and immediately rang. Once. What's up, Mike? We need to have a quick meeting. Okay, I'll be there in a second. The line dropped. Mike heaved a sigh and swiveled his chair. Beyond the windows, the freeway stretched to infinity. Lines of cars sped through Pasadena on their way to Houston proper or points further south. Like most of his employees, he didn't live in Pasadena itself. It was just close enough to make the commute easy and far enough away from certain zoning restrictions to allow Hal to handle volatile chemicals. With their new technologies, rigorous testing methodology, and the painstakingly chosen scientific team, HAL, Houston Analytical Laboratories, Inc., was the most advanced testing facility in existence. Companies from all over the world sent their samples to HAL, and the company was growing faster than anyone had dreamed. Hence the new building. Back in the days before Mike took over and turned it into a world-renowned lab, the company had quietly prospered with only two labs. The original building was old, dilapidated, and on the cusp of falling apart. Maintenance costs, fire inspections, permits, all of it was a hindrance. And the computer systems? The old building could barely handle the power necessary to keep the servers and equipment up and running. But the new building was taking forever. Too many dips in the economy, too many stalls on the labor front. But at least they finally had the new knock up and running. Or rather, they would once Chuckles, their head of network operations, pronounced the facilities good to go. It would still be a few months before the new labs were ready, but Mike and the executive staff would begin moving to the third floor of the new building in the next two weeks, he hoped. For now, though, the sky bridge between the two buildings was finished. He could walk down to floor two and easily check on the progress of the new building without having to go outside. The old labs would continue to serve their clients until the new ones were ready. After that, they could get rid of the night shift and have six labs running simultaneously. He was already vetting a new crop of petrol chemists and biochemists to grow the staff, but Cheevers' team would be the first to move to the new building. He wished it was available for this PPE job. It would make life so much easier instead of having to manage the new building construction, his scientists working on the weekend and the possible power outages. Tapping on the door, Mike turned from the window. Come on in. The door swung open and Darren Strange walked in. The man was impeccably dressed in chinos and a black Hal dress shirt. His clean-shaven face glowed beneath the lights. What's up, boss? Mike chuckled and pointed to the tablet in Darren's hand. Have a seat. We need to discuss this weekend. Darren sat down on the other side of the desk. He smoothed a possible wrinkle in his shirt and stared attentively with a smile on his face. Darren, always prompt, always preened, always ready to help. Mike didn't know how he'd run the place without him. PPE's barrel should be here tomorrow afternoon. Darren tapped his fingers on his tablet. His eyes barely flitted from Mike's. We're ready for it, Darren said. I already scheduled a meeting for you and Kate to go over the particulars later this afternoon. Good. Darren swiped the tablet and brought up a document. I've also made sure we have food coming for dinner, sandwiches for snacking, and a catered breakfast. So what exactly is my job? Your job, Darren said, is to keep us all employed. Mike laughed. Y'all do that yourselves. Hardly need help from me for that. Darren waved a hand. Now, what else do I need to know? What are you worried about? Mike shrugged. Simpson just called me. Darren groaned. You know, you should never have given that man a direct number. True, Mike laughed. But he is a friend. And a pain in the ass. And a pain in the ass, Mike echoed. But Mr. Peter is offering Hal some extra money if we get this done by Sunday. Darren raised an eyebrow and then laid the tablet on his lap. That sounds interesting. Did he say the amount? No. Thought it might be impolite to ask. Of course. But knowing Simpson, Mike said, it will be substantial. Would be nice to put a little extra in the Christmas bonus pool. Darren smiled. I'm sure the scientists would enjoy that. And chuckles his team. That man has been working nonstop for weeks now on the new knock. He says it could even be ready tomorrow. 
Yes, Darren giggled. Every time I go to the new building to check up on things, he's in there fretting over cabling and power connections. Darren shook his head. He's almost as bad as you are. Almost. So what can we do to make sure this weekend goes smoothly? Darren lifted up the tablet again. I've scheduled their breaks. The mother's room is ready in case someone needs a power nap and they don't want to use their office. And, as I said, I have plenty of food and drink. Coffee? Of course, Darren said. Jay would cease to function without coffee. All right. Sounds like you have everything handled. But you're going to stay here with us anyway. Mike grinned. I'll work on packing my office, doing a bit of reading, and maybe take a few catnaps. Uh-huh. Darren looked expectantly at his boss. A moment passed. Darren finally spoke. Is there anything else? What time is my meeting with Kate? In two hours. I think you should probably send her team home a bit early. Mike nodded. I think you're right. Okay, anything that needs my attention? Darren rolled his eyes. Only the construction reports you keep obsessing over? Right. He nodded to himself and slid his fingers across the trackpad. His monitors came to life. I think I'm gonna eat in. Too much to do. Okay, boss. Let me know what you want for lunch and I'll make it happen. Mike grinned. Of course you will. Now get out of here. Let the old man get some work done. Darren stood, smoothed his shirt again, and walked back out of the office. He closed it behind him so gently that Mike barely heard the button catch. As usual, the hall lights were harsh and garish. She walked down the hall to the stairwell. She passed the barely finished sky bridge, nose wrinkling at the smell of fresh paint. The glass panes were still crisscrossed with tape and manufacturer stickers. Kate's laptop was beneath one arm. She barely felt its weight, but was all too aware of what Mike would want from her. Testing plans, schedules, the usual. He was a good executive as far as those things went, but his lack of chemistry or biology education was terrifying. Running one of the premier chemical bio-testing labs should have required a damned PhD. But Mike Beaudry was one of those rare creatures that could look at facts, figures, personnel, etc., and somehow managed to make it work. Instead of pinching pennies and forcing the staff to do with the bare minimum, he was always willing to invest in new tech if it meant they could handle more work. In addition, he rarely interfered with the scientific work, except, of course, when it was a hot-shot job from a high-profile client. The impending delivery of the PPE sample certainly fit that bill. A trio of construction workers were working on the other side of the sky bridge, one of them held a slab of sheet rock and another ran the heavy drill to put in the screws. The third was already painting a finished section of wall with a base coat. The trio spoke Spanish and nothing else. She opened the stairwell door and clomped up the stairs to the third floor. She looked forward to the day when Hal had elevators that actually worked. The new building wasn't ready for them yet, maybe by second quarter, but that was a long way away. Until then, she and other employees had to put up with unreliable elevators, bad-tasting water and power outages, not to mention the musty smell. The insulation in the building was terrible. The stairwell was cold and moist. November weather had brought an unseasonable fall chill to Houston, accompanied by wind and outrageously high humidity. The old building still had its ancient furnace and tons of air conditioning equipment to control the lab temperatures. It was always cold, but not like this. Kate wanted to rub her arms, but carrying the laptop made that impossible. She swiped her badge in front of a glowing sensor. It beeped, and then the door clicked. She readjusted the laptop, pulled open the door, and walked out onto the third floor. Wooden paneled walls shined beneath the fluorescence. Paintings hung from the wall every dozen feet or so. Mike was a fan of dust. Some originals, as well as proofs and prints, stared at her as she walked toward the reception area. She turned the corner. Hey, Darren, Kate said. The man behind the desk wore a black dress shirt with well-creased chinos. He smiled at her. Ah, Miss Cheevers, Darren said. Mike is waiting for you. Yes, I know, she said. I looked in on the sky bridge. It's kind of a mess. Darren shrugged. He leaned forward and spoke quietly. Between us girls, he said, Michael is getting impatient with the workers. If he had his way, they'd be working all weekend too. Kate rolled her eyes. 
Considering how many months it took just to get the knock done, I don't see how he thinks that's going to make things go any faster. Regardless, he sighed, I had to cancel my date for tomorrow night, and I can't go to the big soiree. Darren pretended to sniff. And I had a nice 70s fire red suit to wear. Ruffles and everything. Kate laughed. Oh, I want to see pictures. The droopy look on his face disappeared into a white grin. Oh, there will be pictures. I'll wear it for the pre-holiday holiday party. You're going to be there, right? Of course, Kate said, assuming we don't get another hot shot. Hot shots, Darren thumped the desk with his knuckles. You're working this weekend. Jay's working this weekend. Chuckles is working this weekend. He hissed through his teeth. And I'm the one making sure you're all fed and watered. Kate smiled. What would we do without you? Hopefully you'd get a boyfriend instead of being a fag hag, Darren chuckled. But you're so much fun to drink with. Of course I am, Darren said. But at some point, dear, you need to get back on the proverbial horse. She nodded. If I ever get a night off, maybe I could. Your ex call in again? Yep, Kate said. And I can't wait to tell Maeve she's going to have to spend the weekend here. What an asshole, Darren growled. He ran his fingers through his graying hair. What's the excuse this time? She grunted. Work, but we both know what that means. New girlfriend? That's my guess. We've been divorced more than two years, and he's still dating strippers. Kate clucked her tongue. How do you tell your daughter her father would rather get laid than spend the weekend with her? Darren shook his head. No idea, darling. No idea. His computer dinged. Darren's eyes focused on the message on the screen. Well, Michael knows you're here, he wrinkled his nose. Guess you better go in. Okay, Kate said. Sorry about your date. Thanks, he said. Sorry about your weekend. This sucks. Just think of the upcoming bonus. It's going to be a big one, she smiled. Darren pointed to the wide door on the west wall. Get in there, he chuckled. Yes, sir, she said with a mock salute. Kate knocked on the heavy oak door. Come in, Kate, Mike's muffled voice said. She took a deep breath and swung open the door. Mike Beaudry's office was bright with white light. Instead of fluorescent tubes bathing his desk, two large halogen torches dispelled the darkness. Steel-colored mini-blinds hung down across the windows, protecting the room from the sun's harsh afternoon glare. Mike was just fine without natural light. He sat behind his desk. A large whiteboard hung from one of the walls. Jobs and schedules were marked on most of it. The far right side was clean of ink. The words PPE hotshot glowed in large red letters on the far left side. Below that was a scheduled arrival and due date for the report. Sunday. The barrel would arrive Friday afternoon and then the team would work through the nights to get it done. Kate choked off a sigh. Mike, what's up? She asked. His eyes flicked to the whiteboard. Is that your crew? Is that everyone? She followed his gaze. Hollingsworth, Krieger, Cheevers. Yep, that's us. Good, Mike said. Neil's team will be in the bio lab. Kate blinked. They have a hot shot too? He growled. No, they're still putting together that DNA study for the HMNS. For some damn reason, he can't seem to get ahead, and you know how his team is. She smiled. They work hard. When they work, Mike said. That's not quite fair, Mike, and you know it. The sequencers have been pretty finicky. He rolled his eyes. We spend all that money on their new equipment, and they can't keep the damn things running more than a day before they hit a new bug in the software. He shook his head. Next time I'm making sure the support contract includes 24-7 on-site support. Right, Kate said. Is that all you needed from me? He pointed to the chair across from him. Kate sat and placed her laptop on the desk. I want to go over the tests for a PPE. Simpson has been riding my ass for the past 48 hours, making sure we're ready. Kate hissed through her teeth. I thought he was a friend of yours. Mike nodded. Yeah, so imagine what a pain he'd be if he weren't. She giggled. One day, you're going to have to introduce us. Uh-huh, Mike said. 
Considering his personality, I don't think that's such a good idea. He wrapped a knuckle on the desk. Show me. She flipped open her laptop and initiated the wireless screen display. A projector whirred to life above Mike's desk. The white wall caddy corner from the desk lit up with a spreadsheet. Her mouse cursor turned into a large red dot. She moved it to the first entry and slid it down the column. Normal tests, H2S, moisture, sulfur content, the usual stuff. Timeline, she shrugged. Depends on the sample, really. The report Shauna Sigler forwarded to us is, well, strange. The figures she came up with are a little off the charts. Shouldn't take very long for us to determine how far she's off. But if she's right, Kate licked her lips. It might be a damned long night. Mike frowned. Why's that? I would think confirming them would be a good thing. She pressed a key and the screen switched to a document filled with figures. She moved the red dot to the moisture content. That really can't be right, Mike. And Simpson included in his email that if any of the figures are incorrect, he wants to know why they were incorrect. That might require us to do some deep digging. Mike sighed. Okay, so overtime. He shook his head. Good thing we're charging the shit out of them so I can make this up to you. And we, um, appreciate that, boss. Of course you do, he chuckled. Go back to the tests. She tapped a key and the spreadsheet reappeared. What's that light test? It's a strange one, she said. We've been doing this for a long time, Mike, but I don't get that request too often. We've run it maybe four or five times in my entire career. Mike's brows furrowed. So what is it? We bathed the sample in different spectrums of light. It shows the flow characteristics of the oil, gives us some idea of how it will travel through the pipes over time, as well as through the reservoir. The pressure they cited, though, leads me to believe they'll have no problem. It's obviously not very viscous. Okay, Mike said. And how long is that going to take? She shrugged. A few hours? We have to find the right frequency. And every oil sample is different. Right, goddamn snowflakes. She grinned. That's why they pay us the big bucks. Okay, you have everything you need? She nodded. We've got it covered. Marie is going to start setting up the tests for us tomorrow afternoon, and Jay and I are already calculating medians we expect. Mike waved a hand. Then you should go home, and I don't want to see you guys or hear from you until tomorrow afternoon. We should get a heads up as to when the sample will arrive. I'll make sure you get the call. Kate closed her laptop and stood. Darren said you and he will be here as usual? He nodded. That's right. I'm going to help Darren bird dog you guys. This PPE contract is damned important, and we can't afford any screw-ups. So if I need to bring you a kilo of coke to get you guys through it, I will. She rolled her eyes. I prefer meth. Or that, Mike grinned. Now get out of here. Yes, boss, Kate said. She left him chuckling at his desk. <laughs> 